Hello friends, here we are again. Welcome to my channel. I'm so glad you're here. Now in this class, I'm going to show you how to make a simple pair of hoop earrings that I may also refer to as donuts because, hey, food. Here they are. You'll make these. They're colorful and they're pretty large, so there are a few things that we have to consider in order to make them light. First, the clay. All clays are not the same durability. You'll want a strong one. I'm using Cato Poly Clay, but Fimo, Cernit, Primo are also just fine. We control the weight of the earrings through two means, the overall size of the donuts and their thinness. Yes, I said thinness. I've decided to add chapter headings so you can first run through the class chapters and you can decide if you wanna watch them all. For example, the tutorial begins with color mixing based on the amounts I recommend. If you follow the strategies I employ, you will have clay left over. If you don't, you may have clay left over, but you could also run out. Now, if you're someone who doesn't worry about running out of clay, I'm lucky I don't have to think much about that. Then you might decide to skip that section if you can make a Skinner blend in your sleep, you'll probably not want to watch that chapter either. All right, so that's the introduction. There we are, and let's get started. Well, now it's time to mix our colors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these formulas for the colors will be in the description of the class. And, um... I want you to note something because there are four colors that you need a lot more of, and that is the colors that make the Skinner blend and of course the colors for color replacement. Those are the colors you're using the most. The applied little accents, you need much less of this. So bear that in mind when you mix those up, that this is the sum total of what you need in that violet. That is not much clay. And then you're going to need slightly more of this light orange, but certainly not as much as you're going to need for this or this or this green color or this uh, turquoise. All right. So here's your clay. One ounce of orange, magenta, red, turquoise, and green. Two ounces of white and two ounces of yellow. If you have a scale, you can do what I did. I didn't have to open a new package or anything. I just weighed what I had, and that's how I arrived at it. So I am gonna mix my colors. I will start, let me see, where will I start? Okay, I'm going to start by attempting to mix equal quantities of these four colors, berry, orange, turquoise, and green. Now, I think maybe I'll start with this green because it has the most parts to it. Like turquoise, yellow, green, and white. Five, six, seven, eight, nine parts. So let me get that and let me mix that up to the quantity I want. And then it should be easier for me to adjust the other so I have the same quantity. Okay, I mean, that's the theory. We'll see how it works. Okay, so let's mix that color. Now, this whole section is basically just about clay management. I don't usually have to think about this because I have a lot of clay. So I tend to mix what I want. I just do it without thinking about, oh, am I going to run out of something? That's not the case for everybody. So we have to figure out strategies to use the clay we have if there are limitations and so you don't run out. All right, so we'll refer to the recipe or the formula, five white, two green, one yellow, one turquoise. So what I'm gonna do is I've rolled approximately one ounce of white clay through the thickest setting of my pasta machine and you know, I've been showing you the cutter method, just cut circles, tick, 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 tick. And um, yeah, you know what, that, that works too, but there's another way, and I will show you that now. 
Now, first of all, I'm just going to take and try to cut this into five parts, okay? So by doubling over, now I have two parts. When I divide this and stack, I have basically four parts. To get the fifth, I'm just going to cut the excess away from the edges like so, or, and then roll this through the pasta machine. I might as well do it. <laughs> Why not? I might as well just do it. And now I have five parts. This was, I don't know what that was. All right. So there's five parts of white clay. So now a part is not a cut circle or shape from a sheet. A part has become what I have cut here. And there are five because there are five layers. All right, so the next color is green. And what I will do, is stack the green up and I could stack them all up maybe that's what I'll do maybe that makes the most sense green one turquoise I know that's bigger one turquoise, there we go. And one yellow. And these have all been rolled through the same setting of my pasta machine. I happen to roll them through the thickest setting, but what matters is that they are all rolled through the same setting. That's the critical part. All right, now I will place this on top and do my best to cut away. Now, is this as uh, specific or as precise as the cutter method? Probably not. No, it isn't. Does it matter? I'm not exactly sure if it matters or not. To tell you the truth, there will be slight differences every time you mix if you use this strategy. And what I will do is later I'll separate all this and put it back, the colors back where they belong. Now let's mix this up. The boss. If you guys don't know, Teresa Salgado of Tiny Pandora sells this wonderful, huge, 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 huge acrylic rod. And this was a gift. It was a gift from Lynn Taylor. Thank you very much, Lynn. I love it. Okay, so now I am going to roll and condition it, and I will be back to show you what we have. All right, so here is what I mixed. There you go, the green. And I'm looking at the turquoise. The turquoise is one part white, one part turquoise, and one part green. Now, I want the same volume, so let's weigh it. It is 0.65, so I'm going to go a little bit over because I don't want to be, well, so I'm going to do 0.25 ounces of yellow, no, excuse me, white, turquoise, and green. I'm going to weigh them out, 0.25. So this is another way of mixing. That's 0.4, too much. Point three oh too much. I will, of course, have a bit more of this color than the other. So that's 0.25. So what I can do now is I can either weigh it or I can take the colors, turquoise and green, 
This white has been rolled through the same setting. And go back to the other method. Now this is a little extra on top. I'm gonna to remove it. There will be a tad less white. Okay, let me get this out of the way. And I have to apologize, you guys. My hands are looking so bad. I didn't really realize how bad. I um, I am the person who ignores lotion all the time. Uh, I am the person who shouldn't. <laughs> all right. So when I mix this up, I should have a bit more in quantity than I have here. I'll be back. Okay, so I mixed up the second color, and this is what I have. And it's really plenty. Plenty, plenty, plenty. Because when we make this part of the earring, I roll the clay out much thinner than setting one. You'll see. So trust me on this. Now, I want approximately the same volumes of the berry color and the orange. Now, what do I know? I know that in total, this mass and this mass are in the range of 0 0.75, 0 0.8 um, ounces. So based on that understanding and having a scale, I will proceed and try to work it out so that every color is about the same range in weight. And you know, this is quite forgiving. You don't need exactly. You just need sort of an approximation. And again, the reason why I'm taking you through this is because I don't want you to run out of clay. Well, it's very easy to do. You think I'm not using that much clay. And then suddenly you have no yellow or you have no white or you have no something. So let me proceed. I am going to deal with the rest of the colors. And if there's anything I feel you should know, um, I will stop. Okay, now it's time to mix the orange. Now, I'm going to point something out. I almost messed myself up. See this? One berry, two orange, three turquoise. For, I labeled them. I was counting orange twice in my mind. Whatever. I mean, it's easy to get messed up. Basically, this is two yellow, one orange, one white. And there are two ways to get there, of course. One is by weight. I know that I want approximately 0 0.80 ounces. So each of these parts would be 0 0.20 ounces. Now, if you don't have a scale, you can also actually use clay that you have. I know. Here, I will just do it. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Because not everybody's willing to sacrifice their kitchen scale. I sacrificed my kitchen scale. Well, I wasn't cooking that much anyway. <laughs> All right. So this is just kind of an approximate thing, but I think it works just fine. So let's divide. How long is this? Ooh, it's almost three, in three inches. So I'm just going to mark one and one half. How wide is it? Ah, let's move it over. It's a little bit easier. One and one half. So I'm just going to find the center, more or less. This is not the most specific way to mix. But to tell you the truth, sometimes you just... I personally don't need... I lost the mark. Okay, let me try... Try to find the center again. Oh, there it is. Okay. So some will find this method perhaps a little off-putting because if you happen to be someone who likes things very specific and very particular, obviously that would not be me then maybe this method does kind of worry you. Okay, so I need two yellow, two 
too yellow. So there are my two parts of yellow. One part of orange. One part of orange. And one part of white. Now I'm just going to place this one part on top and cut. Oh, poop. Poop. side. So now I have all the components necessary for that. I have to remove this though. <laughs> now I have the orange. Okay. So I will mix that and I will be back. Okay. So now um, here's the orange. Now we're at berry and there are five parts of berry. You know, I'm just going to use the strategy we employed to mix this orange, which is, and I'll end up with a little more clay, but I'm not concerned. This is how much clay I have. And I like the color, so it doesn't bother me at all. All right, so let's do that again. If you recall what it is, I will just use this orange. Cut, cut. Divide this into four parts. Okay, I'm gonna keep that. And I'm just going to eyeball it this time. And I think, you know, as I said before, if you're someone who needs a very specific color and, or you need to create it every single time, there are other ways, certainly, of mixing large, large quantities of clay. Okay, so I need one white, one white, two red, you know, as a teacher, I find that one of the things that has always concerned me the most is having a classroom of 20 some odd students taking them through the process of let's say mixing colors and then having students run out of clay. I mean you have to figure out ways of making sure that nobody runs out of clay and that can be quite challenging because people have different ideas about what a lot is or a little is and you know so you've got to have certain controls I use business cards a lot for size and I find that helps but this is you know this color mixing these color mixing strategies you really have to keep your eyes open because someone may actually run out of clay and that is not good. All right, so here we have one part magenta, two parts of red and one part of white. And I made a mistake because I need two parts of magenta. No big deal. Two, two and one, okay. So there, now that's the mix. I'm going to mix it up, and then we are going to move on to the last two little colors. I'm just going to describe this. First of all, this light orange, do not mix a lot. Mix a little tiny bit. Okay? I mean, a bit. 
And even this is going to be too much for you. 12 yellow, one orange, and one white. See, this is a case where I would suggest that you just eyeball it. You know the pro uh, proportions. You know you need 12 times less of white and orange than you do yellow. So just take a bit of yellow. Not much. Remember, you don't need much. That much. That much. That's more than enough. That's way more than enough. And then just take a bit of orange and a bit of white. Mix it in. If you like the color, stop. If you don't like the color, then keep mixing in your little bits until you arrive at something you like. My finished color was this. This. You see, yellow is not a really powerful color, so you're not going to need a lot of these other colors to make this color. Okay? But you have the recipe if you want it. It's just a fussy recipe. 12 yellow, 1 orange, and 1 white. Really? Yeah, that's it. Now, violet isn't even... Oh, there's violet. I did write it. So, it, this is approximately two parts white to one part violet. Once again, you are making these little eeny weeny dots. Do you know how much you need? Just an eeny weeny piece. So, take a little bit of white. Little bit. Tiny bit. Dunk. All right? And just... Add some violet. Mix it in. You like it? Stop. If you don't like it, keep mixing it in. Okay, so now let's get back to the other part. Oh. And that's my advice for today. I'm going to mix this up now. Okay, so I mixed all the colors. Dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, when you mix something like this, these small quantities, you probably want to mix enough to use the pasta machine. So this is way more than I need, but it I didn't have to uh, mix with my hands. I could just roll it through the pasta machine, which was much faster for me. All right, this is what we have left over. This much white. I figure this is about hmm, probably one ounce. This much magenta red, orange, and this, which is an ounce of yellow plus this extra. I would still stick with this um, two ounces of white, two ounces of yellow, one ounce of the other colors, a bit of violet. I didn't put that in because then you can be assured that you won't run out of clay. Okay. Oh, and this, because when I did the stacking method. You know, I pulled them apart. And there was just a little bit too much white. So I just took some of the scraps and this is scrap. All right. So now we are ready to begin actually making our earrings. So the first thing we're going to do are these two halves. Skinner blend on one side, color replacement on the other. Now I have basic tutorials on how to do this. Um, I will start it off I probably won't finish because I would like you to watch the basic tutorials and take in the information contained in those, all right? Now, these earrings are about two inches in diameter, so they're heavy. I mean, they have potentially, they could be quite heavy because potentially there would be a lot of clay, right? And I did back them with gold clay. You could use any color you want. You could use one of the leftover colors if you like. Um, but this upper layer, the Skinner Blend, and the color replacement are going to have to be rather thin. I made these through setting three. I think in this class, we're going to go through setting four. I don't find them too heavy to wear. They're quite comfortable. I forget I have them in. But... You know, let me try making them a bit thinner and see if I prefer that or how much thinner they are. I'll weigh them for you um, because that is something you always have to consider when you're making your clay jewelry, particularly with earrings, is how heavy they are. Our ears will only take so much weight. All right, so let's start with the Skinner Blend. 
Okay, berry orange. Starting with our two right angle triangles, like so. This is a very traditional Skinner blend. I stack them one on top of the other, and I will cut a right angle, like so. Now, I like folding because I use a lot of the clay. You see, this is how much I'm not going to be using in my blend, just this much. Separate, put them together, offsetting the corners so that your sheet has an area that is all berry and all orange. Cut the tabs off. First time you roll through, place a two color edge on the rollers. Not a one color edge, but that those two colors must touch the rollers. Boom. Now, every time after you will fold same color edge on same color edge, place the fold on the rollers and roll through. Same color edge, same color edge. Fold on the rollers, roll through. I'm going to show you what it looks like when you fold it wrong. Look at the edge. Do you see one color only? No, of course you see two. Look at this side. I've got orange and I've got the berry and therefore this is wrong. Open it up. Do it the right way. Berry on berry, orange on orange, fold on the rollers, roll through. Okay, I will continue and I will count and tell you how many times I roll through to get a nice blend. All right, now this is 15 times, but you can see because we didn't have a large volume of clay, it's getting wider and it's getting shorter. When that happens, if you don't have enough clay to fold, then simply take the sheet, place this edge on the rollers, reset your machine to a smaller setting, and give yourself some length to work with. All right, I'm gonna show you. I'm on setting zero. I'm going to setting number two. My atlas starts at zero. Now I have a little more clay to work with. Fold. Same color edge, same color edge. Fold on the rollers, roll through, I will continue. All right, so I uh, have rolled this sheet through a total of 22 times, okay? Now, there's no set number of times. Um, I have found that if I'm working with translucent clay and Skinner blending that, it seems to blend faster. It's not that it's really blending faster, it's just that it looks like it's blended sooner. Okay, opaque clays seem to take a little bit longer. All right, so I'm going to set this aside, set up for um, color replacement. All right, for this you're going to need your clay colors, of course, and you're going to need some deli paper. I buy this from Costco. I really like it. All right, so let's start by rolling our two colors through a thin setting. Now, as I said, I did three here, but today I think I'm gonna do four. Okay, I'm just gonna give it a try. I really don't like heavy earrings. So setting four on my atlas is actually setting three because it starts at zero. So let's just roll this through. First, clean the bottom of the rollers. That's where my pasta machine gets to. Okay, so that is setting three. Oh, it looks like I lied. Yeah, this was actually, this was actually setting three on the atlas. So I wanna go to setting four on my atlas.
let's see how much thinner. Let's see if it makes it too difficult for me. You can see that it's a lot thinner, I think. Looks a lot thinner to me. So I'm going to put this on this sheet. Then I will do the same with the other color. All right. Go into setting four on my atlas. And there's a ripple in the sheet, so I'm actually going to fold it and do it again. I go into three first, three first, and then four. And I won't get the ripple. Okay. Now, I could do all of these, the whole sheet, the entire thing. But you know what? I don't want to do that because I always have leftover. You know what happens when I have leftover? It sits around and invariably it's wasted work for me. So I'm just going to do these big enough to do two pairs of earrings by laying the cutter that I'll use down cutting the excess away. This is one of those techniques where you do not want to make a lot. You don't want to make so much. It's better just to make what you need at the time. Okay, so let's give this a go. Okay. The size of the cutter is totally up to you. I am using this cutter. It's a Kemper cutter and it measures, let me get my ruler. It measures, uh, oh, it's one of those sixteenths, seven sixteenths, seven sixteenths of an inch. Make sure the cutter's clean and you know what? I'm going to start in the middle. Don't ask me why. Um, but I'm starting in the middle. And then put it back in. Sharp side up. Now let's do this. And do, oops, this. Do this. I like to offset my polka dots. In other words, they're not lined up one on top of the other, but they fit in the spaces between. One row fits in the spaces between the last one. Totally up to you. I'll show you what I mean. I won't do the whole thing because it's mighty boring. Okay, so let's do the next row. So I cut a dot from between the two in the row below. Louie, take your peanut butter jar and go away. Louie gets our peanut butter jars. Yes, good boy. Hi, good boy. Take it away. Take it away. All right. So now I will put two more and I will basically fill the whole sheet. I will be back. All right, so here are the two sheets. And just to make it a little bit easier to work, I'm gonna take this cutter, put the wrong side on it and kind of center it over the dots like so and trim away the excess. like 
like so. I think these together might make a nice color. Okay. All right. Now it's time to join them. And if you've watched the video, the basics video, I go into a lot of detail about why this works and how you preserve the integrity of the pattern by working between two sheets of deli paper. I'm just going to rub and rub. And you see any white lines between the colors? Those are air, and that means there's a space. So keep rubbing. Because of the paper, you can rub quite hard and you don't lose the integrity of the dots. I also use, just use my finger and force the air out. Actually force the clay to join where I'm rubbing like this. Okay. And I'm actually rubbing quite hard, but you'll notice that these circles are not turning into ovals. They're not getting distorted. And that's because of the paper. If you try it without the paper, you won't be happy. Okay. I'll flip it over and repeat on the other side. Now, when you're ready to release the clay from the paper, just remember that you peel the paper from the clay. You do not grab the clay and pull it off the paper. That, that would be a disaster. So let's just do it. And by holding the paper low like this, see I'm just pulling it like so. That also helps. Now at a certain point, I can take my hand and just hold it down. And once again, see how low I'm pulling that paper? I mean, my thumb is actually pushing against my work surface. All right, now I'm gonna put the paper back on. And this is just because <laughs> my work surface might be dirty. Okay. And I'm going to repeat the process just by kind of trying to pull it flat like so. So let's say it's 110 degrees, you're in some place really hot, Arizona, and you have managed to push the clay and warm it so much that it is totally sticking to the paper. Well, you can, don't throw it away. Don't think you, don't give up. Just take a spray bottle, spray the paper, wait a few minutes for that water go through the paper. Remember, water's a release agent. And then you'll be able to peel the paper off. All right, here we go. There's one. I will repeat with the other one, but I'm not gonna make you watch. I'll be back. All right, so this is ready. And now we have to deal with our Skinner blend. This is the cutter I'm using, it's two inches. I want my Skinner blend, the orange and the berry to be much closer. And that's why I have to turn this into uh, a plug. So here's what we do, very simple. Um, I'm gonna take this clay and I'm gonna make it thinner because it's easier to roll up. So I rolled it through setting three, that's fine. Now I'm going to take this edge, and you see I didn't even really cut it or trim it, and slowly start pushing. So I'm blending, I'm uh, actually rolling it up so that the blend is falling on the blend. It's not going from orange to berry or berry from orange, I'm going sideways, okay?
All right, now I'm rolling, but it's like reverse reduction, right? I'm, ro I'm placing my hands at the ends and rolling to the center. I'm going to make it shorter this way. And occasionally I just take and I push the ends in like so, and then continue rolling. Every now and then, just push it with the palms of my hands and work it down to two inches. My clay is a little bit sticky on the surface because I put lotion on because I know my hands just look terrible. So I used lotion, but there, it's making it a little more difficult to work. All right, so this is good. You see? Right. So now I will flatten it. So I'm taking it from plug. This is what I call a plug. And this is also a way I store my Skinner blends. And I'm going to flatten. And I want this to be just a bit thicker than the thickest setting of the pasta machine. Because I'm going to roll it. And I'm going to roll it down to setting number four. So it is the same thickness as the color replacement dots. Okay. Yep. Yuppie, yuppie. Mm -hmm. la, 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 la. So let's check it out. Hey, it's a little lighter. I can make it even shorter. by pushing it down like that. <laughs> Ta-da, that's better. All right. No, it's still a little bit thick, I think. <laughs> da -da, da -da. Let me just stretch it out this way. Okay, so here we go. Now I'm going to roll it through the thickest setting. Then I'm going to work down to setting number four. I have to clean the bottom of my machine. See? Right there. Okay, here we go. Zero. Now I will go to two and roll it through. Ta -da. And now I will go through four. Let's do a quick double check and make sure they're the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're the same. Okay. Mm, this one feels a little thinner. And sometimes you just have to... No, they're the same. You know, if you pay attention to way things, to the way things feel, sometimes your fingers will tell you things. Just instinctively, you will know. This felt for a moment a little bit thicker, but it's not. It's the same. All right, now I'm going to grab a tile. I will be back. Okay, I have my tile, I have my deli paper, and I have my clay on top of my deli paper. I'm using uh, a nylon cutter, and you know what I like about these is that they don't get distorted. Sometimes the metal ones, they're sharper. You get a sharper cut, but because of the way they're made, metal wrapped around, um, frequently they get distorted. So I found that the Teflon ones, this 
or nylon, excuse me, I'm not sure if this is nylon, uh, actually maintain a nicer round shape. All right, so I am going to position my cutter on and cut. Now, it's not as sharp, so I have to go like this. You see? To make sure that the cutter actually cuts through the clay. Okay, let's see. And even so, it's like, no, you didn't do it, lady. Oh. Okay. Oh, there I did it. Okay. Now, what am I going to do with this? Storing this like this would be a disaster. So this is what you do. You just roll it up and turn it back into a plug. Put it in some place where it won't get destroyed. And then when you need it, if you want to do this again, all you have to do is what we did before, right? Flatten it, roll it, flatten it to the thickness, a little bit thicker than the thickest setting of the pasta machine, and then continue. And you know what? I even roll up the little scrap ends like so. Ta-da, now it's ready for another round or another use. Okay, so now I will release the clay from the cutter. Just press it. Actually, I'm not pressing it. I'm just going to lay it there. Now let's cut the round. Position the cutter best you can. so that it's centered over the dots like so. Then do the same thing. You get the cutter all the way down through the clay. Now I think this will, this color, this is gonna be a nice color, this next up. All right, now. Let's put this on the tile. Now I'm going to have to divide these perfectly because I'm gonna switch parts, okay? Now how do I do that? I do not want to eyeball it. No, I do not because I'll be honest with you, I'm not the best at just eyeballing. One side would be larger than the other. They would not be the same. And that's why I need to make tools to ensure that I do a better job than I would if I were simply looking at it. So I'm gonna take my cutter and I'm gonna trace around with a pencil or a pen, like so. And I'm using the same deli paper. I use it for a lot of things, so you can see it. Now I'm going to fold it and fold it back on itself. The line goes back on itself. And now I know where the exact center is. You see, the crease is the center, right? Okay, so let's take our paper template and put it on like so because I also want the blend to be the same on both sides, right? And I will take a needle tool and just pierce two little holes. That's really all you need are those two tiny holes. Now, because I'm using the deli paper, it's also easy to see where the disc and where the pattern is below. All right, that looks pretty good. Two 
two holes and that's all I need. All right. I, I don't know about you guys. My life is just one big lint ball. It's a lint ball covered with dog fur and cat fur. All right, so now let's cut it in half. It's easy. I find those two holes and I just position the blade at the holes and cut. Find the two holes. Cut. All right, now. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Okay, so let's put this on. So, you know, I didn't press these to the tile for a reason. Ta-da. Now, let me pick this up. And position it the best I can. Now, I'm going to take paper, put it on, and burnish. Just like we did the polka dots. Okay. This is good, too, because I'm going to be baking these on the tile. So, the act of burnishing that center is probably pushing out some air, too like it. I will do the other one and then I'll be back. All right, now it's time to cut the donut holes. Now, you could use something like this and just, that looks like the center, boom. You know what happens to me when I do that? It's not the center. I don't know what it is. Is that called astigmatism? I have no idea. Anyway, so I have to use tools to get there. If I want something that's either exactly in the center or really close. If I just take this and I eyeball it flat and I go, it's not going to be, up. it's just not going to be centered. So I use my ruler. It's two inches wide, conveniently. And my ring sizer, because my ring sizer has these faint scores that run right in the middle of the uh, circles, which are actually ring sizes. I'm going to use size 11. Okay, so the first thing I have to do is along the center axis, I'm going to locate the exact center. And using my needle tool, I just pierced a tiny hole. I'm going to do the same thing on this side. I love this ruler. I love it. I forced Vernon to get them just for me. So I have about 10 of them in reserve. All right. Now, here's where I might actually go astray. I'm going to take move and now I have to try to get that little pin prick in the middle so that the distance from here to here and here to here are the same I don't think it is so I'm just going to move it just the tiniest bit and I think you can see that the score line right there and there are right along that center axis Okay. Anyway, I might not hit it exactly, but I know it's going to be a lot closer if I do this. I'm going to use my uh, acupuncture needle tool. Cara Jane told me about this. It's one of those thicker acupuncture needles, and then I just put a wad of clay around it. But it does a beautiful job of cutting, and it won't cut the uh, acrylic. 
All right, let's go. And I cut to that line so I don't drag either the blend one way or the polka dots, okay? Because you can absolutely do that. Lint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lint. Da, da, da. And here, I'm just trying to just get a grip on it. Okay, I ruined it. I wasn't going to do anything with the middle anyway. So there it is. There's one. Now, I will do the second one, and then I'll be back. Okay, now I'm just going to texture with my sponge. Now, in previous classes, you've seen me do as much of this texturing at the same time. Like, for instance, I probably could have done it with the... Um, the Skinner blend side, I could have rolled it together with the sponge, automatically textured it, but I couldn't do that with the polka dots because the polka dots would get distorted, right? Because even though the, the foam crushes like that, it's adding uh, thickness. And when that happens, then you might get distortion in the dots. And that's why I have to do it separately, like this. Yeah, it's not a big deal. It's not this huge area that I have to texture. And you know, texturing is also optional, but I, it, it's my preference. I don't do very much really shiny stuff anymore because for me and in my work, it, it makes, I think, it makes the clay look more like plastic. You know, of course there are exceptions. If you're doing imitative things, you're doing stones or something like that, that surface shine will make it look more real. But if it's just flat color or color like this and you shine it up, I think sometimes it just makes it look more like plastic. The texturing makes it look more like a ceramic piece. Once again, just my opinion. Okay. So now we have to prepare for these guys. I'll be back. Okay, so now it's time to put these little eeny weeny dots and these little uh, sort of dashes on the other side. I have rolled my violet clay and my yellow clay through setting five on my pasta machine. I am going to use this eeny weeny teeny cutter that I've lost a million times because it's so small because I'm nuts. All right, so the first thing I wanna do actually is find my liquid clay brush. Now, if you look at these, they are small. Everything is small. So I think I'm gonna improve the bond between them, even though this is raw to raw, I don't think it's gonna hurt if I just take a little bit of fresh liquid clay and just put a bit where the dots are gonna go. We'll do the dots first, okay? Just like that. Because as I said, there just isn't a lot of surface area here with this minute dot and the earring base. So let's start. Now, what I'm gonna do first is take, look, this is enough dots for my life. I mean, really, for several lifetimes. So I'm just going to take a tiny piece like that. And I am going to press it onto the tile because I don't want the clay to get stuck in the cutter. I want the clay to stick to the tile. Okay, make my life easier. Now, some of, some of them are gonna stick in there, but 
if I'm lucky, that will happen. You see how I'm pushing and withdrawing the cutter. Looks kind of like bowling pins. And that, I believe, is enough for both. All right. Now, I got lucky. They all stuck to the tile. Now, let's see how lucky I really am. Because now I'm going to pull the clay around them up and leave them right on the tile. That is exactly what I wanted to happen. Exactly. Now I'm going to pick them up. Ta-da. And I'm going to place them like so and press them on. right on the liquid clay. Just like that. Now, if I wanted to, I could sprinkle a few here and there, but I think I'm gonna stick with just where they are. Okay, so the process is, boink, a little bit of liquid clay, wherever you want those little dots, then you put them on. I'm gonna get that done. I'll be back because the next thing we're gonna do are dashes. Okay, now it's time to do the other side. And you know, I realized, ugh, why did I do the purple dots first? It's gonna be much more difficult because I did it in this uh, order. So when you do it, I would suggest you do the strip first and then the dots, all right? I don't know, sometimes I wonder about myself. Okay, so I'm going to take my liquid clay and I'm just going to let brush a light coat on the surface just to make it a little sticky. Let's just go down that far. I'm going to do it on the other side too because I am going to work both sides at the same time. Okay, I'm going to put more liquid on here. As I said, I don't want tons of liquid on here. I just want some. Okay, so my suggestion is that you actually work both sides. Oh, that's not too bad. The liquid clay is making it sticky. Okay. Pat it down, pat it down. And you do it, do them both at the same time. You know, I, I've never tried to knit socks but I understand you actually knit them together if you're inexperienced because that way you have socks that are the same size. And in a way, that's what we're doing here. We're not doing socks, of course, but the scale and the placement and the spacing of these little dashes creates a pattern that has its own scale. And if you do one and then do another, chances are the spacing is going to be different. I mean, chances are the spacing is going to be different anyway because we're not machines. But it will be closer. And it won't look like you did them at two different times because you didn't <sighs> okay so I will just continue working on this I'm not going to make you watch me but you can see I use my blade to cut 
and to place. Then I use my finger to push in. All right, so let me continue doing this and I'll be back when I'm done. Now they are completed. And you know what? That was actually quite simple because um, putting the liquid clay on the surface made the surface sticky. Working with my blade, cutting at the end, it was quite easy just to position them, put them down. They stuck to the clay and then pat them. So you won't have any difficulty doing them either way. So now off into the oven they go. All right, they are cured. My tile is still a little warm. I've been warming my hands on my tile. Arr, arr. Okay, so I'm gonna take them off now. What you wanna make sure of, you, you don't wanna remove this when it's at all hot because at that point, the connection between these very small elements on top and the main body of the earring, that's a little bit tenuous. So you don't wanna disturb that as you know, it's not a lot of surface contact. So wait until they're cool to cold. Take your blade and just slide it underneath to release them. All right. Now, in a lot of my other classes, I have been using screw eye pins um, to connect things, and I really like them. I use them a lot. But they're, they are by no means the only way to create a loop in it. A piece of clay. That's why I'm going to use these little oval jump ranks and I like this size very much. Not too big, not too small. For a situation like this where the backing clay, this is kind of thick right now, but it's going to be quite thin. This is perfect. The wire gauge is not too big, but it's also not too small. Okay. I think they're perfect. Okay, so let me just grab this. Now I'm going to be taking this little teeny, this little guy, and I'm going to be gluing it to the back right there where the two halves meet. So I want that place where I'm gluing to be as perfect as possible because once I get it on there, I can't do anything about it. So I'm just going to gently sand that very place so it's nice and smooth. As if you look closely, see where the cutter cut here? Well, it's kind of sharp right here and that I will have to sand as well, but I will do that after the piece is totally cured. Okay. So now I've just sanded right there where I want it to go. And of course, I'll do this one too, but I'm not going to make you watch me. All right, I'm going to be using this Loctite Super Glue Ultra Gel Control. This is really nice glue, and it was actually, um, I, I did a search, and the Blue Bottle Tree, Ginger, uh, Almond Davis recommended it and you know she was absolutely right the fact that it's a little bit flexible really helps because we are working with a material that is not totally rigid right so you want something that's going to give a little bit at times so let me just put that there ah! <laughs> and I lost it this is one of those times I wish I had a, nails, right? But I don't really have long nails anymore. Used to, but I don't anymore because I play my guitar and you cannot have long nails and play guitar. Well, let me put it this way. I can't. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to take this paper and just press it like that, just a little bit. So when you use glue, this is CA glue, uh, and you're trying to affix a finding, you wanna make sure you glue the finding to the clay, not the finding to the glue, which does happen. 
All right, so that's good. It's just a temporary hold, but very necessary because I'm going to take this clay, roll it very thin, and put it on the back. All right, so let me prepare this. I am going to roll this gold clay. You know what? I'm using gold, but you can use any color you want. You're, you have leftover colors of clay, so that's really up to you. Uh, Ordinarily, I guess I would use black, but um, hey, I like the way these look with the gold on the back. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll this through like setting six. So um, I'll be back. Okay, so here's my gold clay and I did roll it through setting six. It's quite thin. And when you put them together, this is what the total thickness of the earring is. Okay, and that is pretty thin, but I can't go too thin because I um, I want this gold clay to offer a little bit of support, durability, and make it a lot less likely that this earring will snap right down that connection because there's not a huge the surface contact between the right and the left sides is not that great. But I want it thin because you know something? I do not want heavy earrings. So I'm going to roll this through the pasta machine together. Setting six. Ta ta. Done. Now I'm going to take my brush and my liquid clay and I am going to apply it to the back. To improve the bond between the cured clay and the raw clay. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna make my life even easier. I'm gonna take this cutter, the same cutter I used. I am going to cut a circle out of the gold clay. The one thing I do wanna do is I wanna make sure I get liquid clay right in there. Right in there. because I do not want this ring to pull out. Now I'm gonna take this gold disc, put it on the back of the earring, and because I use the liquid, see, I can just kind of slide this very thin gold clay up to the edge. And then at the ring, see, I'm really pushing it in there. Uh, uh, uh want to really get it in there because I want clay in there to hold that little perfect oval ring in. I do not want it coming out. Okay, now since this clay is so very thin, well, I gotta move this over a little bit farther there. I'm gonna reinforce it with another piece of gold clay. I'm gonna use this very tiny cutter. This is a Kemper cutter, doink. Okay, and you can see how it's handy dandy. It just kind of spits it out. Okay, I'm gonna pick it up and put it right there and push. Because as I don't want this ring to be pulled out this way, I also don't want it to break the clay and come out the back. It will not go out the front. So just that little bit of clay is enough reinforcement, I believe. All right, so let's cut the hole. <laughs> and I'm going to use the same little tool I used before. You know, I should work on paper. This paper can be used more than once as long as you don't use the side that has any clay on it because that will transfer. So the backside has no clay on it. 
So you're going to use them at least twice, maybe more. Okay, so let's cut the hole out. That was simple enough. All right, now I will repeat. I will do the very same thing with the other beads. Okay, I'll be back. Okay, so I finished um uh, I finished backing them. Now I will put my signature cane on one of them. Maybe like that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to cure them for the last time. And put them on here. This is nothing but a ceramic tile with a piece of uh paper towel on it. This will Kind of prevent it from getting shiny at all. I'm not really too worried about it getting shiny, but it would be those little bits that get shiny if it gets hot enough. All right, so I'm going to put this in the oven now, and then I'll be back. So they are cured and they're cold. So now it is time to sand them. I'm gonna take the auger mat and do the same thing. Just sand the perimeter like so. happens pretty quickly because the Abra net is very coarse. If you don't have it, of course you can just use a coarse grit sanding block, any kind of coarse sandpaper. Okay. The Abra net takes it down very, very fast. I like it because it lasts longer than regular sandpaper. Regular sandpaper tends to get kind of clogged. Okay. All right, that looks good. And they're very light. I'll weigh them later. Now, this is something I bought in Germany. And what it is is a wooden dowel, a half round, that uh, they've glued sandpaper to the surface of. You don't need anything like this. I mean, it comes in handy, but you certainly don't absolutely need something like this because you can just as easily take something like this to the end of this brush and take your sandpaper and wrap it around and hold it and insert it and sand that way. You don't really need this one. I use it because I have it, but, um, but you know, for what they are, I found them a little bit expensive. Especially since, unlike the Aubrey net, the grit from the uh, clay does clog up the sandpaper. Okay. Now, let me do the other one, and then I will be back. Okay, here we are at the end. It's time to uh, add our findings. Let's talk a little bit about findings for a moment. You know, um, I used to try to use sterling silver. You know, it's so expensive now. I have gone to stainless steel. And I like stainless steel. It is hypoallergenic. And it's very strong. And it doesn't look like that typical finding with a loop and then a, a little neck and then it curves around and then it's got a coil on it and maybe a bead. I don't like the way they look, you know. Uh, so I avoid them and I think they tend to be actually uh, base metal. So you want to avoid base metal too. Now, I just put one of these in. These are stainless steel and I like them because I like that little ball. The problem with these combined with this earring is that the earring is so large that if it's too high up or too close to the bottom of your ear, it's going to lay flat like this against your cheek maybe. 
it's not going to move very much. The lower this is, the more movement you're going to get, and the more likely it is that it's going to drop and it will face forward, so um, the earring will look better on. All right, so this is a case where I believe the earring is simply too small. Now, there are other ways of dropping it. You could use this and put a couple of jump rings here just to lower the donut, okay? But instead of doing that, I'm going to use these. These are also stainless steel. But you can see that if this is going through the ear, the bottom of the ear lobe is probably going to be about there, right there, which means that the donut itself is going to drop much lower than this one. All right, so I'm going to take my pliers. I like these flat nose pliers with teeth because they grip eat more easily. And I'm just going to open by twisting. Don't have to twist very much because you don't have to open it very much in order to slide the O-ring on. <laughs> I guess you need to open a little more than that. All right, there you go, like so. Now let's close it by doing the opposite. Just grip, twist, and close them. Close the loop, and that's it. I will replace this one with this one, but you can see the difference. Here we go. Hmm. I need some uh, aids, some visual aids. There you go. That's not a bad one. <laughs> okay, guys. Okay, I got a better visual aid. So you can see the difference in the drop. You see how much higher this one is than this one. In this situation, this is a much better choice. Now, not to say that these are not usable, but they would not be, I think, ideal for this particular earring. All right, so I will switch that out and then I'll have a pair of earrings. Here's another one with a lighter green instead of the turquoise background there. And uh, that is for the, that's it for this class. I hope you make a lot of earrings. I hope you've enjoyed the class. So until we meet again, goodbye. Okay, so um, here I'm offering you a little bonus. And that bonus is how to make a cabochon donut flat on the back and rounded on the top. And we're gonna use the same polka dots and the Skinner blend. And this is in response to a request from Tracy. So if you like it, thank Tracy, cause that's why I'm doing it. Let's get started. Is cylinder. And I did measure it and wrapped it around and cut the ends. Now I'm going to cut it in half. And when I cut something like this, I, I kind of start at one end, I anchor the tip of the blade against my work surface, and then looking over the top, I kind of guide it from here to here, and I just cut like so, okay? And this is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it, it's pretty good. Can't complain too much. Now, which one is better? Hmm. I think maybe this one. So, I'm going to work on a tile. And now I'm just going to gradually curve the piece. You know, I, I can't go too fast because I run the risk of actually uh, cutting it. So, I'm going to take my time and bring it around. Okay. Now, let's see. I could probably even do that. I can. Okay, now we're going to use our tile. 
So I'm just going to flatten it, press the back to the tile so it's kind of stuck to it, like so. You see? Like that. Now what I have to do is address this join. And I'll start just by trying to stroke one side over the other. Like this. <laughs> doink, doink. Okay, so let's just continue joining like so. Okay, that's not too bad. But you know, I don't like the opening as much. See how it's not really round? Not roundy, roundy, roundy. So, I am going to pry it off. And I'm going to try to make it nice. Like so, just taking my finger and running it along the donut hole. Like so. And I think I can improve it. Because that center hole should be much better than it was. So I'm going to take my finger in there and use my best tools. Those would be my fingers. Okay, not always, but in this case, I think my fingers are just fine. My fingers and my eyes. All right, so there we have it. Now I will use my tile again and press the clay to the tile. And I will have to cover it after it's cured. Okay, now covering it after it's cured, doing this, baking it first, and then um, covering it, well, that's a choice I'm making now. Of course, I could cover it now, but covering it now, I don't know, is six of one half dozen of the other. It's not gonna be the easiest form to cover, let's say with this, okay? It's not gonna be the easiest. But when it's cured, it's a little bit easier to trim from the back and to trim around the hole. Um, but it would definitely be a little more difficult to cover the cured form. You see, when you're working with raw clay like this, and maybe I should just cover it for you, half of it, you're dealing with an understructure that can be manipulated and moved along with the laminate that can also be adjusted and moved. When you're covering something that is rigid and solid, the only adjustments you can make are in the laminate on the surface. Okay, sometimes that's a problem, sometimes not. Uh, in a case like a donut, well, you know what? I'm just gonna try it. We're just gonna do it right now and see what issues we encounter, okay? Because every situation, let me tell you, is a bit different. All right, now I'm going to take, this is also one of the reasons why working with a clay that is stiffer and a little bit harder is, is easier. If a clay were very, very sticky and soft, I, I would have to cure it on the tile. I couldn't pry it off as I did this and not lose the shape. OK, 
Okay. All right. So I am going to cut straight down the middle of this row. Set that aside. And here is the gap. So what I'm going to do is span the gap. I'm going to cover it up. Okay, so let's start at one end and just see. I'm going to try to center this sheet. And that's approximately where. But remember, I've got to make that dip into the hole. So I'm going to move this back. And let's say I put this here. As I said, it's not the easiest. Maybe it won't absolutely be centered. Does that concern me? A little bit, but not that much. And I've created that gap because I believe I'm going to need that clay, you see, to push into the hole. So now I'm going to try to feed the clay very straight across the top like that. Okay, I might have to make an adjustment like so. But you know, I can. Now let's push the clay into the hole. And I know this seems very fussy and um, you're thinking, oh my God, she's making a mistake. She put it in the wrong place. This is the way you're going to have to work. Lightly press, lift if it's not in the right spot. Lightly press, lift. So this is another one of those cases where a clay that is a little bit drier and stiffer is also beneficial. And I think if you work with clay a lot, you can see that I can lift and I can push this down into the hole. Oh Lord, somebody was calling me. Somebody I do not know. Okay. So, okay. And me polka dots might not be in exactly the same place on both sides. You know what? I think I'm just going to live with it for now. Now I'm going to kind of push that clay from the front down in the hole. Okay. Like so. That doesn't look too bad. It could be a little better. I will push more of this clay into the hole and then straighten that edge out. Whoops, oopsie, dropped. Okay. And that, you know, that looks good to me. Looking good. All right. So now, now we have to ease this clay from the perimeter around. And probably the easiest way is not just to start here and then push there. But the best way is to anchor, let's say, there and then try to anchor here, and try to anchor here, and then ease the, the clay in between down to the piece. So let's anchor here. And you know, this is what I mean about having a softer, uncured understructure, because I can actually anchor here. See, I'm anchor. Let me cut the excess away. It might be easier if you can actually see. Okay, there we go. Now, I can even kind of stretch this out and press it to the donut. 
it is possible. It's also helpful to cut away excess clay because it does get in the way. Okay, so let's just like so. Now I'm going to cut the excess away from over here like that. Don't want to cut too much because I still that clay still has to go around the donut and make it all the way to the back. And I'm going to try to ease the clay in. You know, if you sew, you know what this is about. It's like when you're doing a, a sleeve, like an inset sleeve. You have to ease the fabric in. And so working with clay is much the same in many instances where you just have to ease it in. Okay. All right, so I eased that in. And now it's a matter of trimming the excess from the back. I might have to. Straighten that line. You see, it's not quite straight, but I think it will be all right. Okay, and okay, I'll do a little bit of trimming here, like so. And then let's see if I can trim some of this away too. I didn't do as good a job easing here because you can see where it cracked. So I might have to do a little more work here to join that. And it's not in a bad place for this to happen because I think it will be pretty easy to conceal that flaw. Okay. okay, so that's half of it, but the act of doing all that easing, you see how the line here is no longer perfectly straight? This part kind of veered over, which is sort of a natural thing. If that happens, you just straighten out the line. And I would advise that you try it both ways and see, in other words, try curing this and covering it and see what issues you encounter when you do. Because you will encounter some. Okay, now how much does this bother me? See how that edge kind of went, veered off? Well, I can solve that problem by either adding a bit of clay in that turquoise color. like that. And then cutting the excess away by following the line and cutting straight into the center and then removing this excess clay. And now I have pretty much straightened that line. Cut the excess away. Okay. 
and I will do the same here on this side. So you don't have to see me do it again. I will do it and then I will prepare this one. Okay, I'll be back. All right, now um, I clean this up. It's time to actually make a sheet from our Tequila Sunrise. Now this is left over from the class. I don't, I know I'm not gonna need all this. So I'm just going to cut a piece off and roll this through setting three, which is the same setting as this. I am gonna prepare it a little bit, flatten it with a clean acrylic rod, which is really hard to find around here. Ta -da. Okay, now this is going through setting three, putting this edge on the rollers, of course. Ta-da! All right. I'm cutting a knife. Let me make sure it's... Ooh, it's not exactly wide. I think it... Mm, I think it was too short. Okay, so if this happens to you, I, I can tell it's too short. Remember, that clay's got to go dip into the hole, and it's got to make it all the way to the edges. So if this happens to you, take the clay, fold it, place a fold on the rollers, and just do this until it gets wider. Which it does. Every time I roll this fold and roll, of course, it lengthens this way. Now let's compare and see. Now it's plenty long enough, and that's really all it took. And I didn't make the sheet any thinner. Okay. So let's make a nice cut edge. Poop. Um, I was going to turn it over, but I'm not going to. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to take the bad side and make a cut. So remember the color replacement thing we do where when the blade hits the work surface, it gets a sharp edge. Well, that's what I just did. I cut from the bad part, bad side to the good side so that when I turn it over, I have the sharp edge and the sharp edge is what will meet this. Ha ha, there is always a way. I'm going to try to push more of this clay down into the donut hole. I'm trying. And I do love this blend because it does look like a tequila sunrise to me. <laughs> okay. So it's a little bit easier with the Skinner blend to manipulate because I've got no pattern, really. I just have a blend, right? Before, I had to be a little more aware of what I was doing because I had those dots. But with the Skinner blend, it's, you know, I can kind of mush it around a little more and not worry so much. You have to worry a bit, of course, but less. I'm really going to push that down in there because I would really like not to have that gap. Remember the gap I had to fill down in there? Well, it wasn't a big problem. It wasn't a terrible thing to have to do. But, you know, I'd really like not to have to do that. So I think I'm going to cut. I'm going to make a little slit here. And I am very slowly, slowly 
I'd like to stretch this out a bit. Like, see this clay? I'd like to stretch it. Stretching makes it thinner, but nobody's going to know it's thinner at that point, are they? I'm going to take and push that clay to close. See that little gap there? I would really like not to have that. Okay, no gap. So let me do the same thing on the other side because I'm going to have a gap. Maybe not as big a gap because it appears to me that there's a little more clay here. Ta-da! No. I'm going to smooth over the join like so. <laughs> and then just roll over like so. That looks really good. And now going to take my brush, kind of do a little number there. Now let's cut this away and see what we have. Ooh, that looks great. That looks really good. That looks really good. <laughs> I am so proud of myself. Now, I'm going to roll this up. I really am going to try to get rid of some excess. The excess just gets in the way. And by rolling, I, I think I'm getting closer to how much clay I really need to cover. Da, da, da. Okay. Stay. Stay. Don't you move. All right. Look at that. Hmm. Now, the last time I held this up and I... Well, another way you can do it, of course, is to stand it up on its side and then just right along that edge, like right there, cut. Okay. There is more than one way to get... To achieve your end, always. I'm glad Kathleen asked about this. I want you guys to know that if you have anything specific like that, you can please feel free to ask me and um, hopefully I'll be able to do it for you. I will do my best anyway. Okay, so let's flip it over and let's see if we have any huge bits that need to be trimmed away. 
because I'm going to press this back on that tile and that's how it's going to be cured. Now I haven't put the decorative elements on, but I would do the same thing as I did in class. All right, so I don't feel like I have to do that again. Let's just use this tile. And if you want to texture, you know, of course, you just take the sponge and do your best. Maybe you won't get the amount of texture want you want in the opening, but I, I think that you'll get enough. All right, so there we have it. There is a solid cabochon donut and the way I covered it takes a little bit of practice, but please just take your time. And what I'm doing now is pressing to make sure that the back is really flat. And the way I know it's flat is there is no gap between the clay and the tile. I think that's important to the finish because the finish on this piece is going to be a solid sheet of clay across the back. Right? And I really don't want any gapping. So I'm going to really work at it and make sure I have no gap. I want it to be totally flat. And of course, once you press the edge to the tile, you should also inspect the overall shape again. In other words, look at it again. And if you have pushed a part out, if it doesn't look as smooth or as nicely rounded as it could be, make the correction now, okay? All right, now I'm going to inspect the hole. Does the hole look good to me? It's not as perfect as it was, so I'm taking it off. And I'm going to run this tool, my brush, around the inside and try to make it more pleasing roundness. Now, why did that happen? It probably happened because of this clay on the back. I hadn't trimmed enough of it away or I hadn't trimmed it well enough from the back and and that clay is going to go somewhere we know that clay goes somewhere and it doesn't always go where you want it to go now am I going to live with this shape That's much better. But I don't want to get in the same position of putting this on the tile again and then working the around the perimeter and then going, oh, oh not again. So I'm going to trim some of this excess from around the hole. Okay. Because I think that's going to help me a lot. Inspect again, put it down, and that looks better, much better. All right, one last time around the perimeter. No more. Just make sure there's no space. I seem to have made it dirty. but it's a really good shape. 
inspect this line and make sure that it is still straight. Dang, look at that. Okay, uh, I am going to texture it because texture hides a multitude of sins. Ha, huh, there, I gave you my secret. I told you why I texture a lot. Because I do like texture, but it also has the added benefit of hiding. Sometimes it hides flaws. Okay. The hardest clay to work with is white clay. White clay that you want to be perfectly smooth. Because that's when it has to be absolutely perfect. But when you texture like this, you don't really see some of those flaws. Okay. I can even scrape some of this up. with the tip of my scalpel. Make sure the sponge is as clean as uh, I can make it, which is really hard. I think I'm gonna have to really wash all my sponges because I use them so much on black. All right, so that looks about 100% better to me. Can even get rid of that. Okay, so I am now going to embellish with the dots and the, and the dashes, and then I'll be back. All right, so it's cured, and it is cool, and I have paper towel, and I have my Net P80, and I'm just sanding the back. I like it to be nice and smooth. And I'm being kind of gentle with it, because once again, you know, I don't want any of these elements to fall off. Okay. Now we're going to back it. That's good. With the gold again, only this time it's a bit thicker. This has been rolled through setting number four. And I think for the earrings, I was like seven. Really, really thin. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to, once again, texture it by rolling it through with the sponge. All right, so it's prepared and ready to back. Now, because this is thicker, I have more options in terms of the hanging loop. I could actually use a larger ring. I could use the screw eye pins that I've been using so many of and I like so much. Or I can even use this tiny little guy again. Okay, because he's just fine. So I think I'm going to use him. We'll start by gluing, just as I did before, this little guy in the back. A little harder to handle because... And you know what? You can put it anywhere. I mean, if I wanted the Skinner blend side up or I wanted the polka dots up, you know, it, it doesn't have to be dividing at that point where the two halves are divided, certainly. That's just a choice I made. All right. 
right, so I think that's good. I'm going to take a little piece of paper and push it down so that, once again, I sound like a broken record sometimes, I think, but I want to glue the uh, jump ring to the clay. I don't want to glue the jump ring to the glue. There is a difference. All right, good. Now, once again, a little liquid clay is in order. And there's a little bit of a space there. So you know what? I'm going to fill it up with liquid clay. A little bit of a gap there. I'm going to fill it up with liquid clay. And when we did the earrings, you remember we cut out a circle the same size as the earrings using the same cutter. And this time we've got no cutter. Oh, well. Now, I didn't sand that top because I looked at it and I didn't think it was necessary. So let me select a cutter. This cutter is very close to the same size. And um, because I'm going to trim it away, you know, this is one of those metal cutters. Using a cutter makes it a bit easier, I would say, to trim. Now I'm really going to push that clay down in there, in that space, because I want it to have very good contact where the hole is. I might even do this because I don't want this pulling out. Okay. And that looks good to me. All right. I'm going to take my scalpel and I'm going to cut away the excess best I can without interfering with the yellow pieces, the dots or the dashes. I do not want to cut them. So I'm really kind of running just the tip of the tool around the perimeter of the donut. Like so. It looks like the tip of my scalpel is gone. Oops. I don't recall when I lost it, but it sure looks like I lost it sometime. Okay, so now I'm going to put this down on a piece of paper and... Da, 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 da. Bonk, bonk, bonk. And I'm going to use, dang, where is the other, well, this is good enough. So I'm going to start by cutting the excess away like that. So I'm not fighting with my clay. Then I'm going to take the scalpel with no tip and cut the hole. Yeah, when you're trimming sometimes, just if you have too much clay, it, it just makes it harder. So 
using like a round cutter like I did to remove the whole center area actually made it easier for me to do my trimming. Okay, now it's time to cure this again. All right, excellent. Now this is how you deal with a cabochon donut. I'm gonna put my signature cane on the back and I will be doing a signature cane class. It is in the queue of things I want to show you. Because if I do say so myself, my little signature cane is really sweet. It's a sweet one. Yeah, I think that's enough clay. I don't need to put more clay there. I think I've got enough covering. Okay, so this is going to go in the oven. Okay, so here it is. It's finished, and you can see that I just took a, oh, a, a large-ish oval jump ring, and I put it through the loop, and this is a five-strand wire choker that I believe I got this from Fire Mountain Gems, and they're quite nice. I really like them a lot. Anyway, I think it goes with the uh, the donut quite nicely. So once again, if you liked it, thank Tracy, because that's why I did the Cabochon Donut. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.